Okay, maybe it's time to get started. So we're really happy to have today Patrick Hayden from Stanford, and you can see his title, Fault Tolerant Qubit from a Constant Number of Components. All right, well, thank you very much. I, I give two kinds of talks, typically, talks where time uh, increases in the vertical direction and time uh, talks where time increases in the horizontal direction. And this is one of those talks where time increases in the horizontal direction. And the reason I'm giving this one is just that my understanding is that the, uh, uh, the theory group at IAS has uh, discussed uh, quite a bit of my joint work with Alex May or with Jeff Pennington. Uh, and so the things that uh, I would tell you about that go in the vertical direction, I think you, you've been exposed to them uh, quite extensively recently. And so um, I'm excited about this topic. I think it's interesting. And I suspect that it will be new. Um, there will be new ideas in here for almost all of you. Uh, and they're, they're new ideas that are, are satisfying and also quite elementary. And so hopefully you'll be able to, to, get, to get something from it. And the motivation is you know, it's one of the more practical things that I may have done in my career. We'll, we'll see how practical it ever turns out. But it, it is trying to figure out how to um, get, our, get ourselves closer to fault tolerant quantum computing um, using relatively easy to construct a relatively easy construct apparatus um, and relatively non-exotic components. It's joint work with people who were, well, Sumwan Choi and Isaac Kim, who were postdocs when this began and who are now faculty members, and then Noah Shuddy and Kiana Huan, who are students in my group. And uh, Kiana really was the driving force behind this project. She may or may not be listening uh, right now. Um, and if she's listening, she should feel free to pipe up if I ever say anything that's incorrect. So something I didn't test. Ah, no, that's how I advanced the slides. OK. Um, so you're probably familiar. There are multiple approaches to quantum com computation being pursued. And the ones that are most advanced, or probably the one that is most advanced, is based on superconducting qubits. And on the face of it, it looks a fair amount like regular computing. You have some chip, um, and you control that chip uh, via gates and then microwave pulses. Um, also, trapped ion processors have very good um, good quality gates and coherence times. And these devices are a pretty direct translation of the abstract picture of what a quantum computation is supposed to do, where you have individual qubits. So these are these horizontal lines. Uh, and then you interact them via various one and two qubit gates um, to perform some unitary transformation. And then at the end of the day, you measure some of the qubits. And so that's actually pretty much exactly what is going on inside these devices. They're individual qubits. Um, you control them in various ways and get them to individually execute uh, unitary transformations. Now, these technologies are advancing, but uh, it's, not a, it's, it's not a done deal that we'll be able to scale these things up because you need to be able to manufacture and control each of these individual qubits and gates. And that's a tall order when you start to imagine building a fault tolerant computer in which every logical qubit is protected by hundreds or encoded redundantly into hundreds of physical qubits. Uh, and all of this has to be done at cryogenic, cryogenic temperatures with microwave lines being passed down into a fridge and um, crosstalk between the qubits and so on. And so um, this is promising, but it's not yet to, necessarily going to be the final, uh, the final technology that succeeds. You're probably also familiar with these topological approaches. And so uh, Majorana fermions and these nanowires um, braiding these fermions is one approach to doing quantum computation. So the idea there, it, it, it again, looks somewhat like the circuit that you would want to execute. Um, the, the braiding transformations, um, the, these or I guess the state space of these particles carry representations of the break group and through uh, the unitary transformations associated with the individual uh, uh, sections of the braid, you manage to implement, implement unitary gates. Um, unfortunately, just recently, it does seem that the best evidence um, for the existence of these Majorana fermions from the TU Delft group um, is perhaps not as strong as, as we thought that uh, either in a lapse of judgment or potentially even a, uh, an act of scientific mis misconduct, it looks like that, uh, that evidence from a 2018 paper is definitely under question right now. So the, the approach may very well uh, end up succeeding, but right now it's, a, um, it's not too far along. 
Um, but I would like to say that the, the virtue of this approach uh, relative to the, um, say the superconducting qubits or trapped ions is that the, the qubits are topologically protected. And so this lets you, if you manage to get this approach to work, you can avoid a lot of the systems engineering challenges. You don't have several hundred physical qubits per logical qubit. Um, you have um, your topological degrees of freedom that are inherently robust and perhaps a, a relatively mild level of error correction on top of that. There's more going on though. Um, there's a company right near my house here in Palo Alto that is trying to use silicon photonics um, to build quantum comp computation. And their measurement plays a starring role as opposed to uh, unitary gates. And that's going to be a, a theme in today's talk as well. So I'm not going to say too much about what they're doing. Um, and just recently, Amazon got into the game. And they put out a, a large paper. And um, a very important feature of their proposal, they're using superconducting qubits, but the actual memory of the quantum computer is not the superconducting qubit degrees of freedom, but nanomechanical oscillators. And so this is a, a hybrid system that is trying to take advantage of uh, the different physical properties of different types of degrees of freedom uh, in a physical system. And so what I'm going to be telling you about today um, has features in common with both of these approaches. So we're going to try to exploit um, different types of qubits, and we're going to exploit, uh, and we're also going to make use of measurement uh, in, a, in a very central way. So the big questions um, that we're going to, you know, the, the motivation for this talk and for everything that we're doing, um, how can we exploit hybrid systems, right? So qubits with very different control and noise characteristics. This is something we do in regular computers. There's a, a strict separation between the control part of the computer, right, the CPU, and the memory. Uh, and how can we do this? And what, what kinds of new ideas can we come up with to reduce the manufacturing control and calibration requirements that are going to be required for quantum computing? And so the goal of the next hour is to explain how this very simple looking apparatus can support a fault tolerant qubit. And I'll just uh, sketch out what the pieces are. There's a quantum emitter. So you can think of that as a quantum dot or an atom or a superconducting qubit transmon uh, that can, uh, can be excited and emit um, phonons or photons into some waveguides. And so they're going to be two, wave, two waveguides with different delays. And you can route uh, pulses between those two waveguides or to a detector. And that detector measures uh, single pulses. Um, and that's that's it. That's all that you all that we're going to have in this system. And the claim that we're going to get to by the end is that the logical qubit lifetime. Well, so naively, if you wanted to put a qubit in this system, you could say, well, with a delay line, I could store the qubit in the delay line for amount of time proportional to the coherence time of the delay line, using coherence time a little bit uh, loosely to just talk about how long a you know, a qubit can live uh, inside the delay line. But in fact, what's going to be true is something much, much better than that, that the logical qubit lifetime is going to grow exponentially with the square root of the delay line coherence time. So marginal improvements in the quality of your delay line can lead to huge improvements in the quality of your qubit. And to get there, uh, I'm going to start out with introduction to cluster state quantum computation, which is what we're going to be using here. And I'll talk about how to make these cluster states using the apparatus that I've uh, described above. And then I'm going to explain why this is robust. Um, and I'm going to try to first to, you know, give you some intuition as to why this, just looking at this apparatus, this is a, on the face of it, a terrible idea uh, for quantum computation. Uh, it, should, it should not be robust. But when you look at it more carefully, it turns out that, that it is. Cluster state quantum computation is something that was invented by Reusendorf and Briegel um, 20 years ago. And the setup is pretty simple. You have qubits at the vertices, uh, in this case of a, of a square lattice. And so there's a qubit right here, another qubit right here, another qubit right here. And you, you initialize those in a sigma x plus eigenstate. So I'll call that plus, uh, 0 plus 1, where 0 and 1 are sigma z eigenstates. And then you entangle the nearest neighbors on the graph. So when there's an edge between two vertices, um, you, up, you apply a unitary gate. Uh, that induces a minus one phase if both of the uh, both of the vertices in that edge are in the one state. Okay, so that's the, what we call the controlled Z gate. And 
Then you're done with your interactions. That's it. The last step is that you perform a sequence of single qubit measurements on the vertices in this graph. So you might measure, might measure here, measure here, measure here, measure here, but you never apply any more gates, uh, any more unitary gates. You never apply any more interactions between the particles. And so this looks, you know, if I describe it this way, it looks a lot different than uh, quantum computation as you may be used to it, where of course, the, the whole computation is driven by a sequence of one and two unitary gates, uh, ga uh, qubit unitary gates um, that are happening in time. Um, so the 2D square lattice, uh, Rassendorf and Briegel proof was universal. And then about five years later, Rassendorf and Harrington proved that if you had a 3D cubic lattice, and this was not just universal, but it was also fault tolerant. Of course, if you want to actually do quantum computation, it's not enough to be universal, meaning if you could apply perfect gates and perfect measurements that you could do quantum computation. You want this to be robust if all of the, uh, the qubits are undergoing noise and all of your gates are, and your measurements are faulty. So I'll explain why that is. Uh, but before, uh, I'll just point out that it turns out that the sequence of single qubit measurements can be arranged so that uh, they go in rows. So you can start at the top left and measure in a sequence from the top left to the bottom left. And once you've measured that column, you measure the next column, after that, the next column, and then all the way through the lattice. Um, and once you realize that, that the, the measurements are performed in that order, um, it turns out you don't even need to have the whole lattice constructed uh, all at once. Because if I just prepare this, this sub lattice, um, then all of the qubits in the left uh, in the left column have now interacted with all of the qubits they're ever going to interact with. And so at this point, I could measure the qubits in the first column and be done with them. And then I take the qubits in the second column um, and produce a third column, interact the qubits in the second column with the third column. Uh, and now all the qubits in the second column have interacted with all the qubits they're ever going to need to interact with. Uh, and so I can measure them. And so you can produce this, uh, this square lattice bit by bit, measuring as you go along, um, with the net result that one dimension of this lattice can be produced, uh, can exist in time rather than space, uh, more or less. You need, you need maybe two layers at a time, but you don't need the whole thing uh, to be present. How about the yeah. full tolerant version? Does that need a two-dimensional lattice at each time? Uh, so good question. Um, Yes, as far as we know. I'm sorry, could you explain this sentence again? What does it mean in time? Oh, so, um, so this, there's a lattice of qubits. And a priori, when I described this procedure, I first prepared the entire lattice, and then I started measuring the qubits. But it turns out that you don't need all of the qubits of the lattice. Um, to be prepared simultaneously. Uh, it's enough to have essentially two columns of the lattice prepared at a time, and you, you, measure, you measure one of the columns, and then you prepare the next column. And so um, the, you can really think of the, the horizontal direction for this 2D lattice as more or less being the time direction of a procedure, where you introduce new columns as you go along, and you, you, you introduce new columns on the right, and you measure away old columns on the left. So when you say in time, you mean at every given time, you look only at one dimensional object? Uh, yes. Ah, okay. Yeah. So that I, I, it really is that the, la the lattice is in space time, not in time. Or one dimension of the lattice is time. The entire lattice exists in space time. Okay. Yep. And, and Patrick, do you, um, does, is the measurement uh, Sorry, is the, the gate you apply next step depends on the measurement results before? Yes, that, that, is, uh, that is true. I'll, I'll, I'll describe this procedure in more detail uh, in a little bit, um, but it does have the property that the, uh, the measurements you apply in the future depend on the outcomes you received in the past. And so now I'll just explain to you uh, how you might execute a circuit uh, in this picture. And so here I have a two-dimensional lattice. Um, so at each point on this uh, in the, on this rectangular lattice, you, you should imagine that there's a qubit, um, and there are different kinds of measurements taking place. So the uh, the round dots mean I measure in the sigma z eigenbasis, 
the vertical arrow means I'm measuring the x basis, and then some other arrow means I'm measuring somewhere in the xy plane, you know, uh, where these are, where that means a linear combination of the x and y, uh, an eigenbasis of linear combination of the x and y uh, Pauli operators. Okay, so to understand why this works, first notice that what does measuring in the z eigenbasis do? It more or less eliminates qubits from the cluster. And the reason is that if I start off with, say, three qubits in the plus state, as an example, and then I apply these controlled z gates between them, another way of writing controlled z, remember it was a, a gate that applied a minus one phase of both the qubits are in the one state. Another way of saying that is that if one of the qubits is, if say the first one is in the zero state, you do nothing. If first one is the one state, you apply the z operator. Z, I just write z, x, y, or z for sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. And so now imagine that you measure uh, in the z eigenbasis. Um, so this last gate that I'm pointing to, it applies a z to the second qubit depending on whether or not the first qubit was zero or one. But this measurement deter you know, figures out whether the, for the last qubit was zero or one. And so we now know whether or not the phase was applied to the first qubit or to the second qubit. And so after the measurement, um, this, uh, the outcome is either uh, a very little cluster state, or it's a cluster state with a local Z Pauli being applied on one of the, on one of the qubits. Um, but that is, at least in terms of the entanglement structure, um, effectively the same thing. And so it, it potentially could affect gates that I apply in the future, but it, it actually um, does not. Um, it's the, the Z fix up, because I know what it is, I've, I've performed the measurement, I can, um, I'll just say I can, I can take that into account in, when interpreting future measurement outcomes. So we know how to eliminate, um, we know how to eliminate certain qubits. And once we've eliminated them, you can kind of see the, what's left in yellow looks like there's some kind of flow in information from left to right through this cluster. Um, and if you wanna understand how to make gates, you just have to make use of a principle that I think has probably been exploited, or it has been exploited, uh, yeah, ad nauseum perhaps in the study of the information uh, loss paradox in black holes. Measurements that reveal no information don't destroy any information. Okay, so that's just a, a principle that I think you're uh, you, you you've seen many times. Uh, and so here again, I have a very little uh, very little circuit. So imagine that psi is a qubit that was being used in some cluster state computation. Now it's coming in to a controlled Z gate. So uh, part of the creation of more of a cluster state. Now in this, uh, in this configuration, the first qubit is decohered in the Z eigenbasis. And the reason is that this phase gate, if the first qubit was zero, nothing happens. If the first qubit was one, we apply a phase. Um, and that turns this plus into a minus. And so the second qubit um, records whether the first qubit is in uh, a, z a zero state or a one state of the, of, the z, uh, of the Z operator. And so if I then measure in a conjugate basis, I don't learn anything. The outcomes are uniformly uh, probably a half for the two outcomes. And, and so that means that the information about psi has to have been propagated to the second qubit. And when you do the little calculation, what you find is that the, uh, the second qubit, you know, the psi is present in the second qubit. Um, the precise version of psi, you know, there's, some, there's some gates acting on it, depends on the measurement outcome uh, for this x operator or for this, uh, this x measurement. And there's also a Hadamard gate. I'll talk a little bit more about Hadamard later, but it's a unitary gate, um, two by two, uh, a two by two unitary matrix. And so a sequence of X measurements, you can use them as some kind of wire. And so you can see in this circuit now, uh, there's some segments that are actually basically playing the role of a wire propagating information uh, to the right. Now let's just modify that discussion a little bit um, by imagining that I measure not in the X eigenbasis, but um, I, I rotate around the Z axis. So somewhere in the X, Y plane. Now, this, uh, this rotation by Z, because the controlled Z operation is diagonal in the Z, Z basis, this rotation by Z commutes past the gate 
and then, ju ju and then just acts on psi. And so in this case, I'm just actually doing the same thing to, to this rota rotated version of psi, where we've rotated around the z-axis. Um, but together, um, because we have these Hadamards, I should say what Hadamard does, if you conjugate the x operator by Hadamard, you get z. If you conjugate the z operator by Hadamard, you get x. And so if you apply a sequence of these operations, you will alternately be, and Hadamard squared is the identity, I should say, you will alternately be apply, you be rotating around the z-axis and the, and the x-axis. And so courtesy of Leonard Euler, um, we know that we can then perform arbitrary uh, rotations um, in three dimensions or arbitrary SU2 transformations. And so these sections um, in the, you know, these measurements that I've highlighted in pink correspond to you know, executing some arbitrary single qubit operation. And then the remaining sections uh, where I've joined uh, two horizontal lines by, by X measurements, um, by a similar argument to what I've just been telling you, these measurements will not reveal anything about the quantum state coming in um, on, you know, from the left. And so ha they have to execute some two qubit gate. And it's a, a, a theorem of quantum information that if you can implement any single qubit operation and an arbitrary two qubit operation, then that's a universal set of transformations. You can, you, you can execute a dense set of gates uh, in the set of all unitary transformations. And it turns out this is actually a version of the controlled Z gate um, that, this, uh, that this does right here. And so this is, uh, this is basically a proof um, that this, this, you know, th this, uh, this is a, a method of performing universal quantum computation. It may not be the most efficient way to exploit this resource, but it, uh, it's enough you know, to tell us that we can execute arbitrary quantum circuits. So your, your, your theorem, these circuits are going to be planar? Or is... uh, it, like yeah, so for universality, it's sufficient to be planar. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But as I was saying before, not all of the qubits need to exist at the same time. So you should, you should kind of think of this as a space-time diagram going from left to right, uh, where time increases to the right. And in practice, all we need is we need to have two columns of this cluster state prepared at any given time. And we just, we, we introduce new columns as we go along and we, as we measure out, you know, we perform the measurements column by column from the left. And so once we perform a measurement, we just imagine that those qubits are discarded and they're thrown and away. Just to confirm, so you mentioned that uh, this is not a uh, fault tolerance. So it means if uh, there is errors in the measurements, then this is not unitary mapping anymore, like from? Oh, yeah. Well, certainly, I mean, if there are errors in the measurements, uh, if there's just coupling of these qubits to other degrees of freedom, then this will not be will not be unitary. Uh, but more than that, we, we, we know of no way to take this two-dimensional two cluster state and, and make it into a fault tolerance scheme for quantum computation. Um, so I see. So planar is a problem. Uh, planar is a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so that's why we go to, to three dimensions. And so now um, I'm not going to draw the individual qubits, but you should imagine that there are qubits in this three dimensional cluster state where time, you know, if we're actually going to implement this, time is increasing from, uh, from left to right. Uh, and what we do, or at least one thing we could do, is we could use the, the circuit picture to encode, encode some planar quantum error correcting code, like Kataev's toric code, although not necessarily with toric boundary conditions, uh, and then make use of some topological quantum error correction. Um, just as they would do, say, with Google, where they'd use unitary gates to uh, actually encode into um, one of these quantum error correcting codes, uh, and then local gates on their, uh, on their system to perform the computation. That, again, is not necessarily is not the most efficient way of doing this, but it's, it's a way that I think is sufficient to get some in, intuition. Um, and once you've done that, um, and you have to, you know, there's a, there's a little bit more to do, but at least a, from the point of view of generating a, a good quantum memory, uh, you, you can implement the quantum error correction in the cluster uh, and, and protect some, uh, some degrees of freedom. And so Rassendorf and Harrington, as I said, back in 2006, they studied this. Um, they didn't, they, there are better ways of getting these planar quantum error correcting codes from cluster states than using the encoding, encoded circuit picture that I just described to you, but um, it's a little bit more complicated to, to explain. Um, with, with this improved technique, they were able to show that if all of the operations that they apply, so the, the 
um, the inter the the measurements, the the uh, the two qubit gates, even idle qubits, if they all uh, at every time step um, undergo random Pauli noise. So what that means effectively is that every time step, every qubit has some probability of just being ripped out of the cluster and replaced by something that is uniformly random, um, you know, just a, a maximally mixed state. Then there's a threshold in this scheme, which is surprisingly high, um, that you can tolerate quite significant error rates. Um, they found 0.58% per time step, um, or rather, yeah. And in fact, since then, the uh, this has been improved with better decoders and slightly improved techniques all the way up to close to 1%. And so we're gonna make use of something that looks like this. And if you keep in mind that the qubits that you actually are gonna to need to keep at any given time are one of these uh, vertical planes, this actually starts to look like a pretty good way to implement quantum computation using cold atoms in an optical lattice. Um, but we do need to remember that we need to keep, we need to actually have two layers of that lattice present at any one time. And so if you were going to do it in a single layer optical lattice, you then have to start labeling uh, the atoms. Um, but Marcus Greiner's group at Harvard is actually building uh, or planning to build a two layer cold atom simulator that uh, might be able to do something like this in the near, you know, in, in the next uh, several years. But, but to this point, I should say, there has been no demonstration of cluster state quantum computation using, uh, using cold atoms. OK, so now a little, um, a little aside on fault tolerant circuit design. So there's one basic principle uh, that uh, is widely used when uh, trying to make fault tolerant quantum circuits. And I'm just going to try to show you what it is. So imagine we have some quantum state psi, and we're going to encode it into a quantum error correcting code. So the psi is a qubit state, but it in, gets encoded in this case into a, a seven qubit state, which we'll call psi bar. And there's a two dimensional subspace of that two to seven, two to the seventh uh, complex um, or dimensional complex vector space, which is the, uh, the code subspace. Now let's suppose that this code can correct an arbitrary error on one unknown qubit. Right, so something something bad can happen somewhere. Um, it's not enough to do quantum computation to be able to protect against noise. You have to be able to actually execute gates. Um, so we have to be able to compute by acting on these physical degrees of freedom. And we can try to think, you know, what kinds of operations might be useful for transforming psi bar uh, into you know, some other quantum state, uh, as if or as if we'd apl applied a unitary to psi. Well. Something we could think about is applying maybe a, a unitary to a single qubit. But that's actually not going to be of any use because any error on a single qubit is going to get corrected by the error correction procedure. And so acting on a single qubit is, uh, is not going to do anything non-trivial to our state. So to do something non-trivial to our state, we'll have to act on multiple qubits. So this w is a two qubit gate. But let's think about what might happen if there's an error in the circuit, maybe an error before we apply the, the W. If you commute it past the W, that becomes two errors. But the code can only correct one error. And so the, the W actually turns a correctable error into an uncorrectable one. Uh, another way of talking about this is that if each, each of these phys physical qubits coupled independently to some environmental degrees of freedom, then the code could correct errors to first order and perturbation theory. Um, but um, if you apply one of these gates, you will no longer be able to correct orders to first order perturbation theory because you'll have a two qubit error, uh, which, uh, which won't get corrected. On the other hand, if you try to perform a logical gate on your encoded qubit by acting by uh, a product of operators acting on individual qubits, then if one of those uh, individual qubits got corrupted, um, when you commute past the uh, the physical product operator that's implementing the logical operator, you still only have one error on your, uh, on your physical qubits, and so it's, it's correctable. And so the basic lesson is, is that if you want to design a fault tolerant circuit, um, you try to avoid gates that will propagate errors between physical qubits. And this is a rule of thumb, which is applied essentially, you know, I won't say almost universally uh, when people try to build fault tolerant quantum computation. 
Uh, and the buzzword, or I don't know if the buzzword, but the term that is used, we call these transversal implementations of, uh, of logical gates. Now you might worry that with such a, you know, that that con condition is so stringent that you can never actually interact uh, a pair of encoded logical qubits. So here I have two blocks of seven. So imagine each of these blocks of seven qubits encode a single logical qubit. Um, and you want to implement a gate between them. Uh, it turns out that some, for some version of the a seven qubit code, um, qubit wise controlled Zs applied just as I've drawn here actually implement the logical controlled Z. And this has the very nice feature that um, one error, I'm just gonna, one error in a single block like this, if you commute past uh, all of these physical gates, becomes one error each uh, in each of the blocks. And so it remains correctable. So it propagates errors, but it propagates errors in a way uh, which is not damaging. And so I just want you to, what, what I want you to take away from this is, is again, this rule of thumb, avoid gates that can propagate errors between physical qubits. All right, so now do, how do we use- Sorry, so can I ask you a question? So um, this, so this transversality principle would seem to be really bad news for um, basing gates on uh, braiding. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I would say that um, um, Because I don't see how you braid only one qubit with itself. Yeah, so the, the, the story is a little bit different with the braiding um, because the you would have to think about how it's working with respect to the underlying physical degrees of freedom. Um, and I, I, I would say that actually the braiding is, a, is an exception to this story. But this is, this is really more about I, I, when you're thinking about the um, unitary gates acting on physical qubits. Um, that you know, I probably shouldn't have said universally. I should have said that you know, the two ways that we know uh, to implement logical gates robustly are topologically and transversally and then and then ad hoc methods. Because it turns out that um, you can't get a universal gates uh, set of gates transversally uh, directly. And so you have to you always have to have some extra trick if you want to do yeah you know, if you want to um, not use topological codes and and work. Uh, at the gate level, I can I can say more about that afterwards if that. Okay, that thank you. Clear. That was that was clear. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So how do you go about preparing cluster states using a single emitter, as I was describing before? So back in two thousand and nine, Linder, Lindner, and and Rudolph pointed out that if you had a quantum emitter coupled to a, a one dimensional waveguide, um, then just by, uh, so the emitter is the is the top qubit the cluster states being generated uh, in these qubits down below. Um, the Hadamard gate um, takes the zero to zero plus one. And so you can, uh, if you think of this as uh, atomic levels, it, it's, it's like a, a, pi a pulse that partially excites, you know, uh, so you know uh, that partially excites the system. And then a controlled X is basically the, deca the decay of the, of the excited state. And this is a circuit that will actually uh, make the 1D cluster state, it turns out. We'll discuss in more de detail later. And so it's, it's very natural to be able to make 1D cluster states using an emitter uh, coupled to a waveguide. And then in 2017, one of my co-authors, uh, Sun Wan Choi, and, and his collaborators, uh, they pointed out with a similar architecture, you could make a two-dimensional cluster state. If you could emit into uh, a waveguide in one direction, Allow, uh, allow some propagation, reflection, and then you come back and you interact with the emitter a second time before, uh, before passing on. And the reason that makes a two-dimensional two cluster state is just that uh, the, without the, the extra step, you're making a one-dimensional cluster state. So you're making, a, you could imagine it as a helix, but um, because you come, the emitted pulses come back and interact with the emitter a second time, that gives you an opportunity to create vertical links in your helix. Um, and so I drew Tra Trajan's column here, which is a you know, uh, two-dimensional surface being uh, created out of wrapping uh, one dimensional, uh, a one-dimensional ribbon around that surface. The, uh, the figures in Trajan's columns can reach up and touch the feet uh, of their 
uh, um, of the figures at, at a different time uh, in the uh, in the artwork. And so this gives you a way to make a two-dimensional structure um, using this essentially one-dimensional object if you just have access to a delay. And I saw a hottest picture give, give a talk about this, and I was just struck by how simple this apparatus was, right? That with this very simple apparatus and you append a measurement operation over here where you measure these, these individual pulses, this is an, an apparatus that can perform universal quantum computation um, with just a few little basic parts. Um, the basic parts aren't yet up to the quality that would be necessary to make them work. Uh, um, well, and actually, uh, <laughs> or even to demonstrate a proof, proof of principle, um, if you want to really build quantum computation, um, you know the natural question that I, you know, that I had listening to Hannes speak was, well, can you make this fault tolerant? And the natural next step, if you're going to make it fault tolerant, is to just you know use the fact that the three-dimensional cluster state uh, is fault tolerant, and you adapt this architecture uh, to make a three-dimensional cluster state. Um, and I have a, a, a basic question: What, what sure. does quantum emitter mean? Oh, quantum emitter. So it's just um, something like an atom or a quantum dot that has discrete energy levels that you can excite, and when and a decay of uh, of one of those excited states will emit a pulse into a waveguide. And so it will. Um, but is the qubit encoded in these pulses? So, the, like the spin of the pulse or the. Oh, yeah. So, okay, I'll be, a, I, I, can, I can be a little bit, I'm going to be more specific later. Okay. In, these, in these initial proposals, and we're going to change the proposal, uh, the presence or absence of a pulse in the waveguide corresponded to a zero or a one. Okay. okay. Um, and then in this emitter, uh, there was some energy level structure and which energy level you were in corresponded to a zero or a one. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the, the physical setup. Does that answer the question? Uh, yeah, so in, in the, your Trajan column, the horizontal interactions are, are supposed to be interactions between consecutive uh, qubits. That's right, pulses. yeah. What and then you know, and re reaching up to touch the feet of uh, of figures at a different time in the freeze that corresponds to the the pulse returning uh, and interacting with the emitter a second time before proceeding. Okay. Be before uh, exiting the waveguide. But I haven't understood where, where are the interactions happening the the ones uh, that are with well. The so there's the there's the emission uh, into the waveguide. Yeah. Um, and then the only other interaction is when the pulse comes back. You know, so the, the pulse is, is emitted in the left direction. It's reflected off the mirror. It comes back, travels in the, in the rightward direction, comes into contact with the emitter uh, a second time. So there's an interaction there. And then it continues onwards. OK. But in, in the figure here on the bottom left, don't you need to also um, entangle the qubits or have some operation that entangles them across the sides? Oh, yeah, so that happens on, that happens just uh, automatically. Um, oh, in the emission process. OK, fine. In the emission yeah. process, okay. yeah. Fine. yeah. OK, fine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK, so let's talk about, so I'm going to, again, break this down even further. Let's talk about the abstract problem of preparing a cluster state using only interactions between Q, which you know, is this atom, this emitter, um, and the data qubits. And there'll be no two, two qubit gates between the data qubits at all. And there's a simple solution, which is just to use swap gates. And so I'm going to make a little triangular cluster state. And here's my emitter. And let's imagine all the, all the qubits begin already in the, plus, uh, in the plus state. So the first thing I do is apply this controlled Z to get the, um, the entanglement between Q and 1. And then I swap Q onto qubit 2. So I've made one of my edges. And then I apply controlled Zs between Q uh, and 1 and 2. So I have the entangle that's necessary. And, I'll, and then I'll swap Q to 3. Okay. And it turns out that's something you can do uh, if you wanted to in the, uh, in the set of the people we're looking at before. But for the purposes of making fault tolerant qubits, um, we're not going to have a swap gate uh, or an easy swap gate or direct swap gate. And the reason is that we're going to actually in in the in inside the waveguide, 
the zero, both the zero and the one states are going to actually have pulses. And it's just the timing of the pulse that determines whether you're a zero or a one. And the reason we're going to do this is that it makes losses in the wave, wave guide detectable. And, uh, and, and losses, errors that are detectable are much, 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 much easier to, de, uh, to correct than losses or errors when you don't know that they've occurred. And so this is just analogous, you know, someone hands you a paper and says, this is an interesting paper, but there's a mistake in equation 233. Um, you know, then you can easily verify that the mistake is there and possibly correct it. Um, whereas if someone just hands you a paper and says, this is an interesting paper, there may or may not be a mistake in it. Um, you are faced with a much harder task. And so if you can turn loss errors into loss errors, that is always a detectable loss errors, that's always a, uh, a huge advantage. But it turns out that we, uh, with, this, uh, with this setup, we can do a combination of swap and control Z, uh, it turns out. Um, because this is equivalent, you know, swapping controlled on, in, on initial data qubit, which is plus, just by a little bit of matrix algebra is equivalent to the controlled not gate, controlled X, uh, and then a Hadamard. And so I'll just illustrate to you how you will, how we can now make a two-dimensional cluster state using those gates. Uh, and so I'm, here I'm depicting the, uh, the time delay a little bit differently. Here's the emitter. It's gonna emit qubits into the waveguide and the waveguide has length proportional to L, where L is the linear size of the cluster state. And then the waveguide is redirected uh, close to the emitter for an interaction before the final measurement. And we're going to try to make this cluster state here. And I'm going to show the circuit all simultaneously. So the first step uh, is that we apply this controlled knot. Um, and this really corresponds to um, emitting into into, into the waveguide, depending on whether or not the emitter state was a zero or a one. And then we apply the Hadamard. And if you recall our little circuit identity, that's equivalent to first swapping and then applying the controlled Z. And so the net effect of this is to end up with, inter with entanglement between the qubit or the, uh, the emitter and, uh, and the first qubit of the cluster state. So now what happens after we apply a C0 and a Hadamard again. Well, remember that C0 and Hadamard was first swapping. So we're going to swap Q to position two, and then we're going to entangle it. So, we, so now we, have, we swap the entanglement of Q and one to one and two, and then we created some entanglement. We do that again. Um, and then when we go to the next line, qubit one, which was making its way around the waveguide, comes back into contact with the emitter. Uh, and that induces a controlled Z gate, that in induces a phase. And so we have, that creates the, the vertical line here. Um, and then the subsequent two gates uh, cre uh, create the new edges in the, uh, in the cluster graph. As we proceed, we can continue just entangling um, and swapping, and we can produce the entire cluster state. So, and if you wanna make the three-dimensional cluster state, the story is very similar. I can't claim you know, there's no real innovation here. We just introduce a second delay line, OK? Uh, and the total delay is going to be uh, proportional to L squared. And so qubits are going to, cut, are going to be emitted. Or, sorry, uh, that was a little fast. What, what are the delay lines you went? Through? Yeah, I'm going to explain that right How here. did the delay lines get into this? So, the, so here I'm going to talk about the, this picture. We have the emitter. The emitter is first going to, uh, it's going to emit into this delay line of length, uh, let's just call it a delay of length L. Um, it will interact with the, um, the, the data qubits in that delay line will interact with the emitter after uh, L steps. And then they'll enter a longer delay line whose length is L squared minus L, at which point uh, the qubits will interact with the, the emitter um, for a third time, and then, the, and then they will be measured. And this will be the apparatus uh, with which we're going to make our robust, uh, our, our robust qubits. And so what that looks like, um, the, the first steps are actually exactly the same as they would be, as I just described, uh, to make a two-dimensional cluster state, exactly as on the previous slide. Um, and so the first qubit is emitted. Uh, and then travels through the, the delay line. And while it's in the delay line, we just 
we end up making the first row of this cluster state. And then that qubit comes back, at which point it interacts with qubit number four, um, uh, or uh, emits with, uh, interacts with the emitter when the emitter is preparing qubit number four, and that creates the vertical lines. Um, and then once an entire sheet, uh, it, the front plane of this, uh, of this cubic lattice is prepared, then the, the data qubits come back for a second interaction, which gives them the opportunity to create this first, you know, right here, this gate will create the first gate um, going into the plane of the screen. And then the second gate here will make the second gate into the plane of the screen. And so this procedure will make the three-dimensional cluster state uh, using two delay, two delay lines. So, sorry, so let me see if I understand. So in the, sure. in the quantum di circuit diagram on the bottom, I'm trying to just look for a simple difference be that happens at gate 10, um, which shows me that I'm going from two to three dimensions. And that's the three dots on the top line. Isn't that's it? exactly right. So th this additional dot here, um, is a dot between qubit one, so this one right here, and the emitter. Uh, and what is the emitter doing at this time? Uh, it's getting ready, um, let's see, to emit into uh, position 10. So it's getting ready to emit the qubit that's going to be here. And so this edge right here creates the entanglement between one and 10. Okay. How, how do you make further layers in the, into the third dimension? Is it obvious? How do you make the well? So this is. Um, so remember, we don't need to have. I mean, if you just continue this procedure uh, as, as I'm doing, then you're going to you're going to make a three dimensional cluster state with some twisted periodic boundary conditions. Um, if you just if you just uh, repeat this uh, this procedure exactly as I've been uh, been describing it. And so the um, if if none of the qubits ever like if we if we did not put a measurement right here but just had an, a delay line that, or just had a, a waveguide that could go to infinity, then the qubits in that uh, one dimensional waveguide, if you organize you know, they would have the entanglement between them would have the entanglement of a three dimensional cluster state. They would be physically arranged linearly in space, but as a graph. You know, but if you uh, you could think of you know, if you labeled them properly, then the entanglement would be the entanglement of this three-dimensional cluster state. Oh, I see. So it will grow in the direction perpendicular to the screen somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And um, and, and the, just to confirm, so the the qubit here is the time, the the zero one is it the yeah that that is the label. Uh, the time label, um, so the, the, this, the, the data qubits, and label one means the first one to be emitted, label two is the second one to be emitted, and so on. Yeah, but for each qubit, uh, the, the, growth, the, the, the two different states, are they like a slightly different time of the pulse? Oh, yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I see. And, um, and, and what happens if your L, like if you want an integer L, but it's slightly different from integer? Um, do you mean like what happens if you don't want quite a square lattice but something else? No, I mean like you want a square lattice but you don't exactly have that L, then will you have? Will oh, that I see. Um, that's not a huge problem. Um, as long as you know the timing between the pulses, like I should say, like the way you control Q by by pulsing it um, with some. Um, like if you were an atom, you'd, you'd probably shine light on, you know, laser light on it. And as long as you know when the qubits are being emitted and when they're going to come back, so you know that what how long the delay line is, then you, you know when to pulse it appropriately. Thanks. So there'd be some calibration required, um, you know, so that you know exactly how long these waveguides are. But you know, you you can um, you can work that out. Like in practice, if these waveguides are really long, then they might actually grow and shrink as a function of time. Yeah, you know, as the temperature fluctuates in the room or something, and then you, yeah, you know, there'd be some additional stuff that you'd have to do to track that over time. But uh, we'll, we'll we'll ignore that for for now. Okay, so all right, so that's the procedure. But now I'm going to tell you this is 
on the face of it, this looks like an absolutely terrible procedure for doing anything fault tolerant, right? Because what did I tell you about the, um, you know, the rule of thumb, thumb for designing fault tolerant circuits? Avoid gates that can propagate errors between physical qubits. And what are we doing here? There is one qubit which, inter which mediates all the interactions with every other qubit. And so it looks like if you, something goes wrong in that ancilla qubit, you are going to spray errors through the entire circuit. And so let's just see if that's true. Um, suppose there's an X error you know, at this point in, you know, in the state prep, cluster state preparation circuit. What happens? Well, if I want to know what errors are on the final state, then I have to take this X operator and commute it past all these gates. So I commute it past this first CZ gate, and I'm going to end up with an error on the first qubit and an error on the uh, or on the emitter and an error on this on the second data qubit past this one and I'll end up with an error on the fifth data qubit and so on. And when you run those all the way through, um, this is what you find uh, that indeed an error at this point on the data qubit or on the emitter is going to actually create errors on half of the data qubits in the cluster state. Um, but this actually looks, you know, it's it's like an epidemic, but an epidemic where you know the doctor that's going to see the patients is actually you know, infecting everybody as he goes to do his rounds, right? It's a, uh, it, this looks like, a, as I was saying, a terrible way to actually build anything that's fault tolerant. Um, but let's, uh, let's step back a little bit and think more abstractly about these cluster states. So the cluster states can be described by the operators that leave them invariant in a very, uh, very straightforward way. Um, and so, the cluster state is the unique state, which is, is invariant under this set of operators, um, where there's one operator for each vertex in the cluster state, and the operator applies an X there, and then a Z on all of the neighbors. So for, uh, for eight here, there'd be an X on eight, there'd be a Z on seven, a Z on two, a Z on nine, a Z on 11, and because of the periodic, periodic boundary conditions, I think there might be one or two more here as well. Um, and so acting by um, one of these stabilizer generators, we call them, you will not change the cluster state. And so the final state generated here is a cluster state multiplied by all of these errors. Um, but we could, here is the S8 stabilizer, here is the S10 stabilizer. Um, we could we could multiply these the stabilizer or the, the cluster state by these stabilizer generators without, without changing it. And so um, as far as the state is concerned, um, the combination of the red and the blue multiplied horizontally uh, is the same as the, as the red alone. And if you're Pauli squared to the identity, and so if you look at this, you'll see, oh, actually, um, all of those errors are physically equivalent to a single error on the seventh data qubit. Um, so somehow all of this junk that got, you know, that, got, that got sprayed through the circuit, it only affects qubit number seven right here. Um, which seems like a small miracle, um, but it's it's not a coincidence. And so this is something. This is sorry. A are you are you saying that the output state is in a stabilizer code, so that? Uh, well, it's it's not exactly a code because there's a single state, uh, but it's a one-dimensional sub. Yeah. So it's a. You know, it's but, a but I mean, the, act, the action code. of this, this this group that you're describing looks exactly. like exactly. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so. It turns out that any single qubit error in that circuit um, at the end of the day is equivalent to um, a small cluster of errors located on the neighborhood of a single vertex in the final cluster state. Um, and so I can actually pretty much argue that to, to you because um, it's, so it's actually quite, kind of nice to see. Um, so if there's a Z error uh, acting early on on one of the data qubits, Z doesn't affect a zero state, so that's not a problem. Um, and Z commutes with, with these controlled Zs uh, because they're diagonal on the same basis. And so that just becomes a single qubit Z error at the end. Now, to understand what's going on more generally, the main observation is just that as we build this cluster state, instantaneously at every time, we actually have a cluster state. Uh, and so the same stabilizer description applies to the instantaneous cluster states that we've made. And so let's think about this time here um, that I, uh, where we inserted the error before. 
the cluster state that we've managed to make at this point uh, looks like what uh, I've drawn right here with the emitter part of the cluster state. And so we apply, if there's an X error on the emitter, what is the stabilizer generator associated with the emitter? It's X on the emitter and Z on its neighbor. And so that's equivalent to a Z on data cube at seven, which is what we saw by much more obscure algebra on the previous slide. And similarly, so for this later time in the circuit, um, the kind of cluster state we've made, the emitter is now entangled with a pair of qubits. An X on that emitter is going to be equivalent to Zs on its neighbors. Uh, and then that emitter is going to be swapped into position 10. And so the errors are going to be Zs on, the, on a neighbor of 10. And so that's how you actually uh, see that while this circuit design uh, at the outset, you know, when, when we started doing this, we weren't very optimistic because it, you know, it looked like this would spray errors all over the place, but we were very pleasantly surprised to see that this would work. Um, and I'm going to go a little bit quickly um, through the definitions or well, so, um, so you can then study this and say, let's, let's imagine that, uh, that each of the gates in this, uh, in this circuit, just like Rausendorf et al. Uh, we're talking about fail with some probability P. Uh, and when they fail, you just take that qubit, you rip it out of the, uh, out of the system and you replace it with a uniformly random bit. Rausendorf et al., using the same decoder as Rausendorf et al., uh, we got a threshold of 0.39%. So it's a bit worse than re what Rausendorf et al. found, you know, maybe about uh, 30 some percent worse. Um, but that seems like a small price to pay because we have a circuit that has more gates in it. And every single qubit error we saw actually did propagate potentially to uh, a cluster of errors on the neighborhood of a single qubit. And so um, we, ex you know, we expected to pay some price, um, but we didn't pay a huge price, right? That the, the threshold is still quite high. Um, and I told you before that you know, we, we went through some trouble uh, to actually design a way to do this uh, such that we could um, force the, the, the errors in the waveguide to be dominated by loss. And the reason is that we can calculate um, the relation, you know, a joint threshold for loss errors in the waveguide and circuit errors in the gates and the measurements. And what you see here, I saw there was, we saw there's an, if there's no loss, the probability of error that we could tolerate in the circuit was 0.38%. Um, that's this point. Well, you see with loss errors, we can tolerate up to somewhere around 22% 20, uh, losses. So we can, act, we can actually lose a kind of macroscopic fraction of the cluster state and still be able to recover and perform fault tolerant universal uh, or perform universal quantum computation. Okay, but I have to you know, be honest here and say that that error model is not really appropriate to the situation that we're thinking of. In that error model, we just assume that there was a constant uh, error per gate, but we're using these delay lines. And so the qubits are sitting idle for some very significant fraction of time. And so what we, what we really should be modeling uh, is a, an error rate per unit time, taking it into account the fact that the, uh, the, you know, the errors will accumulate while the qubits are in the delay line. Um, but it turns out to still be quite good. And this is what I was telling you before, that the logic qubit li logical qubit lifetime ends up scaling exponentially with the square root of the delay line coherence time. And to get some intuition for why that's true, um, let's just think about our delay line errors. So we, we have a surface code. Um, and the surface code is topological. And so if you want to act non-trivially non on the surface code, you want to have some sequence of operations that perform some homologically, you know, that uh, are on some homologically non-trivial cycle, or at least to the decoder, uh, looks more like that than anything else. Um, but for that to happen, uh, your, um, the probability of that happening is, or it's, it's unlikely that will happen, that suppresses uh, and is suppressed um, by an exponential in the, uh, in the linear size of the lattice. At least it's suppressed by an exponential in the linear size of the lattice, if the errors are occurring at a fixed probability below the error threshold. So let's say that our error probability is P. Um, if the actual rate of errors per unit time in the delay, delay line is eta, then that probability is actually 
uh, eta times the, the length of the delay line, so L squared. Um, and so you have this trade-off. Increasing L decreases the logical error probability as long as you're below threshold, but increasing L increases the probability of errors until it eventually will exceed the threshold. And so heuristically, you'd expect to find some optimal L where when the actual error probability was proportional to the, uh, to the threshold. And so we would expect the logical error probability, if you just substitute it back in, to go as exponential times minus one over the square root of the uh, delay line error rate, which is just another way of saying that the logical qubit lifetime will scale exponentially with the square root of the delay line coherence time. Um, OK. And we verified this uh, numerically. So this is the, the prediction. Yeah, and then the, the dots are actual are looking at this for different sizes of lattice. Um, and I'll just, uh, you know, you're, you're all familiar with exponentials. I should say um, actual commercial optical fibers uh, have loss rates you know, for realistic numbers that are right, right around the break-even point uh, for what we need. Um, now, these have been optimized, so we, we don't necessarily expect to see huge, huge improvements in optical fibers in the near future. But if you could reduce that loss by a factor of 20 or so, um, then you could get uh, effective logical error rates of 10 to the minus 10 uh, per time step. Uh, you reduce another two and a half times more, and you can get the logical error rate down to 10 to the minus 15. Um, now, for various reasons, which you, know, you can ask me about, we actually think that the, the system that is most likely to, uh, where this is most, most realistic to be useful, is a transmonic superconducting qubit coupled to nano, uh, nanomechanic or coupled piezoelectrically to a phononic waveguide. And that kind of technology has only actually started to be explored in the past couple of years. And we're we're within a factor of 10 you know, with, the, with the, really the very first experiments of the noise rates required to, bre to break even. Um, but I, I think this, that may really be the, uh, the platform which this works. And so just to summarize what I've been telling you about, um, we proposed a way to make a fault tolerant qubit um, in which we only use a constant number of components. And so rather than having many, many qubits, each of which has to be individually manufactured, controlled, and calibrated, um, we just have you know, a, a detector, delay lines, maybe some routers in this emitter. Um, contrary to all expectations uh, and the apparently stupid way that we designed this thing, um, the propagation of errors uh, is effectively local. And so this can be protected. Um, and this design, it exploits the relative strengths of two kinds of qubits. Our propagating qubits can have very long lifetimes, low loss rates, and the um, the emitter uh, is controllable, um, but may not necessarily have uh, as good noise properties. And it's important to point out that it's sufficient to get the noise rates for the emitter below some fixed threshold value. You don't have to keep improving the emitter uh, in order to get fault tolerance. And so when we did our, uh, our numerical experiments, we, we just fixed the noise rate in the emitter to be 0.1%, which was below the threshold value. And then uh, from there on, improving just the waveguide uh, leads to longer, you know, this exponential uh, growth in the qubit lifetime. Um, and so the message that I'd like to share, share with you, I mean, this is one example, um, but we've done two things here that I think have really been underexplored in the world of quantum computation. The people studying fault-tolerant quantum computation in the past, they basically assumed they had lots of qubits, the qubits were pretty homogeneous and had similar properties, um, and they also applied this rule of thumb not, you know, to try not to propagate errors. So we found that, at least in some circumstances, uh, and we understand this one, we don't know how, you know how widespread the phenomenon is, you can allow, uh, you can relax your rule of thumb and still have fault tolerance circuits. Uh, and it's also highly beneficial to make use of the different noise characteristics and controllability properties of different kinds of qubits. And uh, experimentalists really taught us that. It was uh, the Yale group um, that really first pioneered storing you know, using transmons and oscillators uh, in some hybrid system to get long coherence times. Um, but the, the theorists really have only started to look into those questions recently. I think there's a lot of unexplored and hopefully fruitful territory to, uh, yeah, to mine, or I guess a, if you don't mind me mixing a metaphor. Um, and with that, I'll, uh, I'll end and thank you for your attention and your, um, and your tolerance of this talk, which was uh, somewhat outside of uh, the usual fare for the seminar.
Well, thank you, Patrick, for that uh, marvelous talk. So let me open the floor now for questions. I see Greg has a question. Uh, that was actually clapping, but I do have. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was like that was the clapping icon, not a question. Yeah, raise okay. hand. But I, I I do have a question. So, um, so um, these these cluster states and this this error description you gave started to sound a little bit like group theory might be useful. Mm -hmm. A suitable you know groups subgroups of the Pali group you know, the nth product of the Pali groups. Um, is there, is there, a, I mean, how could you define the way you define stabilizer codes using group theory? Is there a way of just defining these uh, cluster states using the Pali group? Oh yeah, no, I mean, exactly. So that, that what I- could, actually, you, could you say it? I think that might- Oh, oh yeah, so I can even just scroll up to show it to you. Um, so right, right here. So this, if you, if you have a set of, uh, a state of some set of qubits and it has the property, so this is a, um, this is a commuting, commuting set of products of Pali operators. Right. That I have right here. Yes. Um, and there is one for each qubit. Okay. And so the, and these are independent generators of this, of this uh, product of Pali group. And so each one of them basically cuts the dimension of the uh, of the Hilbert space in half. Good. So is, is is a stable is a cluster and, state just so, well, I'll, I'll just, stabilized? Yeah. So, by this so the, the cluster state is the unique plus one I, simultaneous plus one eigenstate of all of these stabilizer. Oh, that's great. That's very helpful. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, the the machinery of stabilizers is very much uh, very much at work here. Um, But, but again, we don't know if we, we don't have a very good understanding. Um, it's an, it's more of an example rather than a theory, right? Um, like we, we, we see that it's possible to exploit these phenomena, but we don't, you know, we don't know what kinds of, you know, what kinds of states um, have this kind of universal property for quantum computation. There are other examples in the cluster states. Um, and we don't know under what circumstances you'll be able to suppress the errors. And so, yeah, there's definitely room for group theory. There's some, you know, there's some topology under the hood um, related to how you actually do the error correction in this three-dimensional cluster state. Yeah. Um, Patrick, so um, I have a question. So, um, okay, so um, naively, I thought the photons will will be much more like a non interacting and uh, um, better than phonon. So uh, wh why is phonon a better realization of this? Uh, so the phonons, so first you can, you, know, you can couple the the transmon to the waveguide much more effectively than you can couple um, like a, a quantum dot to a waveguide. So there's this, um, this figure of merit they call the cooperativity which um, is basically the ratio of the emission being into the mode that you want versus not into the mode that you want. And, uh, and so we need cooperativities that are in the vicinity of one over the threshold error rate. And that hasn't been achieved, actually. That's like one, you know, people who do integrated um, quantum optics, they're trying to do that, but they, you know, they haven't yet achieved cooperativities at that level. A transmon with a microwave cavity they have actually achieved cooperativities at that level. Um, I, Amir, Amir I, it's, he's in our own department, but Amir uh, Nini Safavi uh, is the, the leader on this. And uh, he's confident that he can do that for trans, transmons um, made in lithium niobate, another superconducting material that has nice piezoelectric qualities. And he has a student right. who's, who's, who's doing that for her PhD. Um, so, the other reason is that it just turns out, um, and we, I'd have to talk to Amir to find out why it actually is, but they have been able to achieve very, very long coherence times with these nanomechanical oscillators, like on the order of seconds. Um, and so that's for single mode, um, a single mode waveguide. Um, but 
it, it just, you know, for, so I don't actually, I, I have to admit, I, I don't understand the, the details of the physics, but as a matter of practical you know, fact, um, the losses are very low. And it turns out that it's dephasing error that is likely to dominate uh, in those systems. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, so it seems like if you add another loops in your delay lines, you can build even uh, higher dimensional lattices. Mm -hmm. So does it provide any advantage or it's actually worse because uh, qubits are um, idle for a longer time? Yeah, so you have to weigh, yes. <laughs> uh, so at, you know, if you wanted to go to, you know, if you you could you could iterate this as you say, and then you'd have a delay line of uh, of length l cubed, um, and then it starts to look like the the break even point is a long way off. Like I I, I didn't you know, I didn't run the numbers, but you know, we were sort of on the verge of breaking even you know, for for a number of these technologies with the l squared length delay delay line, um, and you're going to be So I think, like, say, the optimal lattice size, I, I don't know what the optimal lattice size would be, but um, I, I, near the break-even point, the optimal lattice size was something like 10 by 10, um, or like the linear size was 10. And so if you throw on another, another factor, it's an, it's an order of magnitude, um, and it might be more like 30. And so the, it, the advantage that you could gain by going to higher dimensions is that it turns out I haven't thought this through very carefully, um, but there, there, yes. Um, so the like the uh, no, actually, well, actually, no. I, I I don't know what what advantage you would gain immediately. Um, from a practical perspective, I I think it would you know it, it looks like it would be daunting certainly the next ten years or so. And from a theoretical perspective, I'm not sure what you gain. If you could go to five dimensions, then um, then the the topological codes acquire some interesting new properties where they can be self-correcting. So you could you could save on the error correction machinery, which might be advantageous. But then that would be two orders of magnitude, uh, which would make it even harder. Oh, I see. Thank you. Um, I have another question if there is time. Um, <clears throat> so so um, I think the, the model is assuming that you can only interact the qubits when you are come back to that point. Yeah. And um, um, in practice, is there an interaction like when I'm halfway through, like I'm wondering whether that's a problem. In like practice. how well is, that, is the qubit isolated before it returns to that point? Um, well, I think How well is it isolated? I think that depends on how you actually implement this waveguide. Um, like the 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 original proposer proposal of Pickler et al was to, was to have a mirror, um, and you could imagine some kind of losses at the mirror. Um, but I don't think that interaction like if they were photons, I don't think that yeah you, know, you have to be very concerned about interactions. Um, the a mirror had some ideas about guiding the qubits, so, you know, or you know, guiding the data qubits in such a way that there wasn't actually you know, a single mirror, but there'd just be some waveguide that was meandering around and then returning to the vicinity of the qubit, and you could you know you could gate the interaction, or, or you 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 prepare the the emitter in such a way that it's receptive to the interaction when the qubit comes back, um, and and so I don't think there's anything special about the halfway point necessarily. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned this number of 10. So if you want to have a large number of computation with a large number of logical qubits, let's say, I don't know, a million. Yeah. Is the idea that you need a, a lattice, which is a million by a million or? Oh yeah, so good, so good, very, yeah, very, very good question. So this is why the title of the talk, 
is just a fault tolerant qubit rather than you know, full scale quantum computation. And the reason is that if you want to encode multiple qubits in one of these toric codes, um, you're going to do that by puncturing the, the surface you know, to create some interesting topology. And the defects that you introduce, you want them to be separated, you know, like the, uh, the exponential suppression of errors that you'll see in the code depends on the separation of these defects that you introduce and their size. Um, and so that means that the, the toric code that you're going to want to make is, is going to be, uh, well, maybe, I guess it goes like, like, a, like maybe the number of qubits you can, you know, you can put in it is going to grow proportionally to L squared. Right. right? right, um, right, right. But, but we have a hard, you know, we sort of have a hard limit at a given error rate at, at what L can be, at how long the, the delay line can be. And so the next step in this uh, in this program would be to talk about how you would then attach these things um, with multiple emitters to actually uh, stitch together larger cluster states so that the number of logical qubits could grow uh, proportionally to the number of emitters. Um, and we haven't thought through that carefully yet, exactly um, all the details. Like it should, it should be possible. Um, well, yeah, it, it should be possible. But exactly how favorable it looks is not is not so clear. Like. If you were doing this with optics and the photons were traveling in, uh, like the, the waveguides were, were actual fibers, then every logical qubit would actually have some you know, coil of fiber that you'd have to you know, put up somewhere. So that, that starts to look unwieldy. Um, the, the phononic waveguides are going to be much smaller. Um, and for the 10 to the minus 15 error rate that I was talking about, that corresponds to a waveguide that's on the order of millimeters uh, in size because of the slower uh, propagation. Um, and so that's, that starts to sound a little bit more reasonable. So Patrick, just to check, the, the, it's not that the error of the emitter that needs to get better to limits L, it's just the, the decay time of the waveguide. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Once, you, once you're at some fixed, you know, once you're below threshold for the gate errors with the emitter, um, yep. and we just said, you know, about three times below threshold, you're, you're fine. Just You don't gain a whole lot by pushing that lower. Cool. I was just slightly, slightly confused by your wording previously, but yeah, I, I might have missed um, that's consistent yeah. with 